Please be seated. So does anybody else here feel kind of bad about lemmings? I feel bad that the only thing I know about lemmings is maybe the only thing you know about them, which is that they tend to, you know, rush off cliffs one after the other in herds. Well, have you ever wondered whether there's more to the poor lemming than this one really unfortunate characteristic? After all, we humans do have this tendency to zero in on a startling trait or an unfortunate event and kind of make it definitive. Years ago, Ardell's uh, nephew Josh missed a flight And so from that day on, in any conversation about Josh, his Aunt Ruthie was likely to shake her head and say, well, you know, Josh misses planes. (laughs) It just seemed a little unfair to take a guy who maybe just had a really frustrating Thursday in an airport once and drop him into a particular category of human beings, those who miss planes. I guess I've always wondered if something like that might have happened to the poor lemmings. Do bands of them really just go plunging off of cliffs on a regular basis? Or or have we been unfair to characterize the whole species by this one curious and evolutionary, very unhelpful trait that maybe just happened to a lemming or two over the years? The only attempt I've seen to fill out the lemming personality a bit was a New Yorker cartoon with the caption, Canadian Lemmings. Uh, The herd is all gathered, yes, at the proverbial edge of the cliff, but all of the speech bubbles above their heads say, after you, no, after you, after you. (laughs) So Canadian lemmings are polite, there's that. But it's still a trip over the edge that they're negotiating so nicely. My point is that the fact that we find the metaphor of a herd of rodents mindlessly rushing off a cliff so useful probably says more about the species that made the metaphor than the species that supposedly does the cliff diving. The metaphor sticks, maybe because in our culture there may be nothing worse, including being a misser of planes, than to be somebody caught up in the foolish will of a crowd with no independence of mind, no individual conscience strong enough to counter the groupthink that seems so pervasive and so destructive. There's much to be said about the importance of being self-aware and independent thinking enough not to be caught up in the destructive energies of a culture or a group. In fact, I think Jesus speaks to this in his teachings, reminding us that there is a way of being in this world that we must die to if his way of seeing and being is to come alive in us. But I increasingly think that the good news of Jesus might not be dispensed to us in individual portions. Redemption is something that is God's doing, not mine. Something maybe God does among us, not just within me. Especially, I think, as it's told in the Gospel of John. But one more quick story. Recently, I read a piece in the New York Times. It was not about lemmings. It was about idiots. I know you're thinking that's all they write about these days, but this, this, was actually a, this was actually about the word idiot. Apparently, it was only in the mid-19th century that idiot came to mean a person of low intelligence. Going back to its Greek roots, what the word idiot really means is someone whose actions have nothing to do with those of the community around him. Idiot shares a root with idiosyncrasy and idiom, right? The idiot behaves only according to his own conscience and desires and cares nothing for common things. He speaks in the narrowest of idioms, sayings that have meaning only to himself. And so according to the ancient Greeks, it is this person, one whose life and actions have nothing to do with his community, this person is the grave danger to our common life, not the mindless lemming. So maybe it's best we don't have one of those signs out on 2nd Street announcing sermon titles, because I might have named this one, Don't Be an Idiot, We're All Lemmings, (laughs) which might not have been helpful. But I really do think that all this nonsense has something to do with the Gospel of John which we've been reading 
in church for the past few weeks. Reading John in the year when we usually read from Mark makes for a stark contrast, doesn't it? In Mark, for instance, there are several moments in which Jesus' healing powers are limited by the lack of faith out in the community. It takes him two tries to heal one blind man. There are miracles he just can't quite perform in his hometown because he finds so little belief there. In Mark, Jesus' power in the world seems to be connected to and even limited by the faith out in the community. But John is told from a different perspective, isn't it? John constantly insists that in this Jesus of Nazareth, the whole present order of the world is being undone and overturned. Now the ruler of this world, we just read, will be driven out. This is the story told on a divine scale. It is not one that hangs on whether you and I each get our spiritual stuff together enough for this overthrowing to take place. The hour comes for Jesus to be glorified when the hour comes, right? What's striking then, maybe, is, is the way this powerful upheaval and the way things are makes its way into your life and into mine. And as I read John, God's redeeming love makes it into our lives, if you will, a whole lot more like a rush of energy through a herd of lemmings than it does through one idiot deciding to follow Jesus all by himself. Last week we read the the most famous verse in the whole New Testament, John 3.16. Naturally, Amber focused on the snakes in that passage in her sermon. Who wouldn't, right? But we did read John 3.16. And it's a verse that's usually read as if what God is after most is an individual decision to believe. Now, if you think about it, the idea of deciding to believe doesn't make a lot of sense. Because belief is a symptom of all kinds of other things in our lives, right? Experience, reason, biology, what you ate for breakfast, relationships, especially relationships. Deciding to believe something is a little like deciding to have goosebumps. It's hard to do. On the other hand, belief really does matter immensely to our lives. What you believe in is the world you inhabit to a very large degree. If I believe there are snakes and lemmings slithering and scampering around outside every exit of Calvary, that's the world I'm going to inhabit until someone or something convinces me otherwise. My heart rate and my blood pressure will be related to what I believe the truth is, not to what the truth is actually is. So belief really is everything in the human experience, which means that believing you are loved infinitely by God is of infinite importance, because if we don't believe it, we don't experience it. And I think that's what John 3, 18 means when it says, those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already Because they haven't believed. To believe you're condemned is to move through this life as a condemned person, even if the judge has set you free. So that was a bit of a diversion back into the Gospel of John, I admit. But since John got to be known for this verse about each of us believing as individuals so that we don't perish, I just think it seems relevant to what we just read from John 12, where we find this less famous statement of Jesus. I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. And just to make sure we're clear what he's talking about, John adds, he said this to indicate the kind of death he was to die. In other words, the power of the cross would not be the power of a really good idea that individuals could be convinced of, to believe, or made to understand all by themselves, The power of the cross would be this vast attraction, a drawing of all people to Jesus. All people will be drawn, is what he says, not just the believers. All people, whether we know it or not, are drawn. And the good news, it seems, is that we're being drawn to Jesus like, well, like a herd of lemmings, not one idiot at a time. We're being drawn toward a love that actually looks to all the world like death. That's the cross, right? 
That's its scandal. It is in Jesus' receiving this unjust judgment of the world and being lifted up, exposed as failure, that somehow God undoes the power of this world. God's redeeming love, he says, works like so much else, like grains of wheat that have to fall into the earth and die. I guess what John challenges me with today is to let go of this idea of saving myself, even through my own faith. To let go of the notion that following Jesus happens one conscience at a time. Because maybe following Jesus is really about knowing and believing and trusting and having our lives be guided by this truth that all things really are being drawn to God. Friends, strangers, enemies, even creation itself in the end. How would we live if we really were a people who believed deeply that in Jesus the full force of God's love is drawing all of us, all of us, into itself. Don't you think what we'd be caught up in next is the healing of this world? If we saw every broken down life we encounter as equally worthy and equally caught up in this great pulling of Jesus of us all, wouldn't our attitudes and our judgments and our relationships and our actions all be driven by something more like Christian hope instead of by the desperation and the despair that can arise in a world that still languishes in injustice and poverty and racism, in hopelessness and all those other forms of brokenness. Surely it was a ridiculous cross-like hope like that that fired that twinkle in Desmond Tutu's eyes when, when in spite of the evils of apartheid that were so firmly in power all around him, he said... I've read to the end of the book, and we win. That is a world-changing kind of hope, born by this belief that the healing of this world actually is not only up to us. So maybe together, as Jesus' church, we can learn to live a little more like lemmings than idiots. Maybe we can live like we're each just part of this great herd of humanity that the cross still exerts its redeeming pull upon. And maybe together we can remind each other to look out at this broken, unjust world with all the affection and faith of a people who believe in a love that still draws us all, lemmings, idiots, and all, to its perfectly merciful self. Amen.